Dear friends and family in Christ, through your baptism, the Lord made you his very own. He washed you and made you clean. May his grace, hope, and peace be with you now and always. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for the precious gift of holy baptism, for washing us and making us clean, for renewing us, for drowning the old Adam and Eve that lives within us, that we might live as your sons and daughters. We pray that each day we might live out our faith, reflecting our love to our world, to our community, to to the very ends of the earth. Help us to share that good news so that all may come and believe and be baptized through your holy name. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wash, rinse, repeat. Or lather, rinse, repeat. I imagine it's been a little while since you've looked at the bottle of your shampoo to find out how you're supposed to use it. But on the bottle of just about every shampoo container, it says those words, wash, rinse, repeat. Now kind of in a modern day and age, it's humorous because it doesn't finish with if it's necessary. Can you imagine if you just followed those directions explicitly and and just kept washing, rinsing, and repeating? You'd probably leave your shower with an empty bottle of shampoo and maybe a few less hairs. There was actually a a novel that was written uh, called The Plagiarist by a gentleman by the name of Benjamin Shevers. who uh, He wrote this novel and, and the ad executive doubled the, according to him, doubled the sales of shampoo by adding that word repeat. Now, I bring that up not because actually, maybe actually quite contrary to baptism. Because we as Christians, we oftentimes, we look at baptism and we say, washing and rinsing and no need for repeat, right? Once we've been baptized, we look at ourselves and we know that we've been made the Lord's. We've had his name written upon our hearts. We don't need to wash, rinse, and repeat again and again. In fact, Martin Luther at one time, he quipped that once you've been baptized, you, after that, only are getting a bath every time you have water splashed on your head. Now, he went into it a little more than that because he had quite a bit to say about about those who would re-baptize. But when he said that, he was focusing on the power that is in baptism, the power that we celebrate each and every day. That we are God's baptized children. Not by what we have done, not by a pledge we have made, but by the work of the Holy Spirit giving us faith in our hearts, and even though it is mysterious to us, by water and the word, washing away our sins. And how true it is that we celebrate that promise. That we call ourselves Christian people. People who are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not what I do pouring water over a child or an adult's head. It's not what the child does coming forward or the adult. But whether you're four months old, 94 years old, it is the work of the Holy Spirit bringing faith to our hearts. Martin Luther in his large catechism talks about this briefly in in just a beautiful way because he refers to it as a treasure. A treasure that we cannot comprehend, but a treasure nonetheless, much like, although we don't understand completely Christ's death and on the cross, still it is a treasure for us. Let me read to you really quickly here. Thus you see plainly that there is here no work done by us, but a treasure which he gives to us, and which faith apprehends, just as the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross is not a work, but a treasure comprehended in the word and offered to us and received by faith. Truly a gift of faith, a treasure that's given to us. A means of grace, a vehicle by which God pours out forgiveness upon us is right at the baptismal font. And we we celebrate this every week, don't we? We celebrate it not only at the font, but we celebrate it when we come to the Lord's table and we receive that precious gift of his body and blood. We can't explain it, but we know that he tells us he's truly present and gives us forgiveness. When those words of absolution are spoken, he tells us those are his words to us. They're not my words, but God's words. And I'd love to end the sermon right here, honestly, because that ends on the perfect note of grace. That means of grace that God has given us. And maybe some of you are even saying, well, why don't you then? And that's because uh, Paul actually confronts us in Romans chapter 6 with, with a couple questions. I encourage you to turn in your bulletins now to Romans 6 and actually and look at the text that we've been given for today. Now, this is a great text, and I encourage you to actually, if you have time to read the entire book of Romans, Paul does a lot talking about sin and forgiveness here. But let's go to the first couple of verses there. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? And it's that last question that I want to dwell on for a minute. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Now, of course, Paul is talking about in our baptism, 
in the waters of baptism, the old Adam, the old Eve that lived within us is drowned. So we have died to sin and now live in Christ. But here Paul is asking a rhetorical question, isn't he? How can we still live in sin? We call ourselves baptized children of God. We call, him, uh, call ourselves sons and daughters of God. So how can we still live in sin? No, Paul doesn't try to answer this question. Instead, he goes right all along with how we should live instead in light of the resurrection. But how would you answer that question? What if Paul stood right before you and he looked you right in the eye and he said, how can you still live in sin? Aren't you a baptized child of God? What would you say? How would you answer? And some of us, we, we, we might want to make a couple of excuses and say, well, you know, and this and that and that. Or maybe some of us would say, well, I'm not such a bad person, actually. In truth, what about so-and-so? And we have a habit of doing this because it, it helps us to escape that burning question. How come we still live in sin? It helps us to escape because when we point the finger off ourselves, it's easier. Instead, we look at ourselves and say, well, you know, I'm in church this morning. That should count for something, right? I'm a, I, I'm a Christian and I'm here. I'm not such a bad person after all, am I? Well, what about those people who are sleeping in this morning? Well, what about those murderers? I certainly haven't murdered or maimed anyone. I'm not such a bad person, am I? You know, it's easy for us to admit we're sinners, actually. A lot of us, we go around because everybody else is sinners. It's almost like a popular fad, but the truth is, it's much harder to take an honest look at those sins. To answer that question honestly, if I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, that God is the Father and the Holy Spirit continues to work in my life, if I make that confession, then how can I still live in sin? How can I still lead each day as a sinful man or a sinful woman? How can I lead each day saying that I'm a Christian who's been baptized and still do the things that I do? And maybe it's not the things you do. Maybe it's the thoughts that go through your mind. Maybe it's not the words you say, but it's the th thoughts of your heart. Things that maybe you think about someone else and you would never utter to them, but you, you think about it anyway. Maybe it's that desire to get revenge on someone who's wronged you, who has done something to you in the past. Maybe it's just that simple wandering from God. That daily knowing He's there, but, well, I'll get to Him when I get to Him. You know, it's much harder for us to look at our lives, though, and ask that question, and to look at, to look at our lives honestly, and even as baptized children of God, and still say, I am a sinner. In fact, John, he confronts this very thought in, in his epistle to the whole church. He says, if, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You know, if we look at our lives and we say, well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a Christian. I do most of what I'm supposed to do. I pay my taxes on time. We're deceiving ourselves. We're not lying to God because God can see all things. He's not blinded by our lies. We're only lying to ourselves. We're deceiving our own hearts. We're convincing ourselves that we're okay. The truth is, we're not okay. The truth is, we're dead in our trespasses. As we confess, we're poor, miserable sinners. As Paul said in, to that young pastor, Timothy, he is the foremost of all sinners, or as we remember from the King James, the chief of sinners. How hard is it for us to stand before God and say, I am the chief of sinners? How hard is it for you to take an honest look at your life and say that to God? Lord, I know what you've done for me. I know that you've called me your own in baptism, but I am the chief of sinners. I disregard your laws. I disregard your words to me. I disregard your promises. I live life as though I am the only one who is in charge. It's much harder to do that, isn't it? But that's exactly what we need to do. John follows that verse that I just shared with you from 1 John. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive, forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Each day we again need to return to that baptismal font. 
Although we may not need to be rebaptized, we certainly need to go through the washing, rinsing, and repeating. Not just every day, but multiple times a day. We constantly need to return to that font and remind, be reminded of what happened in that baptismal font. That we, our sins were washed away. That our sinful self was put to death. That our old Adam, our old Eve, was drowned. We constantly need to do that. To repent of our sins. To come to the Lord. Because only then can we truly see His grace and mercy for us. Only then can we truly see His love for us. To see where we were. We were dead in our trespasses. You know, you think about it, and, and we use those words, and we pass right over them a lot of times. But when you think of death, death, what do you picture? When we think of death, we picture someone who, who's lifeless. You can see the difference in their face, in their body. They're, they're no longer, their, their chest is no longer rising and falling. Their hands no longer have a little movement. or you can't see, There's no longer blood pumping or air in them. If you could look in the eye in their eyes, you just see emptiness. That's who we were. That's who we were before Christ gave us life, before He breathed into us the life of salvation that came in that baptismal font. We were <coughs> we were dead in our trespasses, but He has made us alive. He has made us alive, not with simple water, but by water and the Word, in a way that is mysterious, that we do not fully understand, but a way that He has guaranteed us that promise of forgiveness, that promise of salvation, in a way that we that point excuse me, that points us back to the very cross, that points us to the place where He gave up His life in death, so that we might have life from our death. So we might have new life. And this is where Paul turns on the gospel just full bore. You notice that we start a new paragraph there and just it's layer after layer of gospel. But he says to us, now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with Him. And what does that mean, people of God? That's not just a promise that here on earth that He walks with us every day. Yes, we're going to get to that in a minute. But that is the promise of eternal life. That is the promise of the resurrection. The promise that as Christ came, as He died, as He rose again, we too will die. We are going to lose this life short of Christ coming back first. We are going to lose this physical life. But because of His death on the cross, we will be made alive again with Him. And as I told my confirmands on Monday, not just as a spiritual being floating around heaven, but we're going to have pinchable bodies. Just as he had a pinchable body, a body that was truly there, we will again be resurrected, given new life as his people. And just as we die with Christ, we shall live with him. And that is the promise of the gospel. And that is the gospel that Jesus gave to us when he rose from the grave. That is the promise that he has given to us when he returns again. And that is the promise that he gives to us each and every day to sustain us as sinners who need to wash, rinse, and repeat and again come to that font. That is the promise that he gives us that we need to constantly be going to him and seeking his guidance and forgiveness and his grace. And it is there at the, at, in that place that we are humbled and broken down. And we realize that as much as we'd like to say we're good people, it's better to say we're God's people. As much as we'd like to say that we've lived pretty well, it's more beautiful to say that we've been made perfect by the blood of the Lamb. And it's from that place that each day that we are prepared then to live our lives as the baptized children of God, as Paul said, set free. Set free to live out the gospel faith. Set free to live in this world. Not to bar ourselves in the doors of the church, but to go out there and truly live lives committed to the Lord. And it's not as though we have to search for these good works. It's not as though we have to wrestle in our mind and see, well, God, what do you, you know, uh, I don't know what to do. Because God already in advance prepared good works for us. Just listen to Paul's words in Ephesians. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. As His baptized children, as those who have been created as His people, recreated through baptism, He is already preparing good works for us to do. Those things that we do in reflection of the Gospel, not for the sake of our salvation, but because we are saved. 
those works that we do to share that message that we do believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, that we do believe that the Father is in control of all things, that we do believe that the Holy Spirit is continuing to work in our world today, and that does affect the way we live our lives. That is exactly what Paul had in mind in Romans chapter 6. He was telling these people, this church in Rome, guys, don't give it up. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater here. You, got, you have the gift of the Gospel, the true message of salvation. Now go out there. Be the people of God. Stop worrying about your sin and you're bound of your sin. Confess it every day, but don't let it hold you back. Don't let it keep you here in the church and scared to share the good news. But go out there. Tell others about His love. Tell others about His mercy. Tell others about what He has done for you. The way that you were dead and are now alive. The Gospel is not dead. We don't leave it at the font. That's where we begin. We begin at that beautiful blessing, that beautiful celebration of new life that we have, that rebirth that we have as the sons and daughters of the King. And we go out. We go out washed and made clean, knowing that our sins are forgiven. Knowing that in those, in those words, I, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is as if God Himself said, I forgive you. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to you for making holy the waters of baptism, for washing us and making us clean, for making us a, a sinful people, taking away that sinfulness, making us new, re, re, giving us a new birth. Lord, we pray that each day that we would live lives that bring honor to you, that we would live lives that reflect your love and that, that we would not be caught up deceiving ourselves, thinking that we're pretty good or okay, but that we would instead turn to you and be made perfect again, that we would again turn to you instead of just being good people, that we'd be your people. Lord, we pray that each day we would again return to that, our baptism, to that promise that our sins are forgiven. May you bless us now with your peace, which is beyond all understanding. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.